When it comes to the Mario Kart series, a lot of people want to point at the golden age of the games, saying things like, Mario Kart Double Dash is a superior one! Nah, ah Mario Kart Wii is the most technical and fun! Wow, notice that? That's called bickering, and it's something we don't tolerate around here, because this is goddamn Mario Kart. Wait a sec. Welcome to Days of the Races, where me and my friend Sprad get to take a look back on the Mario Kart games that have been released, and just talk about our feelings on each title. We are going back in time through each release from 8 all the way to the very first title. Today, we are covering Mario Kart 64. Mario Kart 64 was what a lot of people's first experience with the series was. I remember being a very small child, playing the N64 in my family's living room, and even if I was much more interested in Cruising USA back in the day, I did play my fair share of 64, and remember playing it a lot more on the Wii Virtual Console, and the memories that I had with both versions are so significant to me. This was a system seller right next to the other great games in the library for the N64, and it was revolutionary at the time. I mean, the very first attempt at Mario Kart done on the SNES with Super Mario Kart was basically 2D, so to take a look at the series now and seeing how it's in the 3D realm was such a really big leap for Nintendo. Between the 3D visuals, revamped gameplay that felt entirely new compared to what played before it, and the constant new tech being discovered in the game for the time trials and speedruns, both casuals and experienced players got a lot of enjoyment in a lot of unique ways from this kart racer. Hell, even Mario Kart 64 added the 4 player split screen mode, which was a standard found in Mario Kart from here on out. The tracks went from 2D to 3D, along with the cart and character models as well, and so much of what I mentioned now were quite literally the building blocks into what we have today with Mario Kart games like 8 Deluxe. And it all started on that fateful date, February 10th, 1997. Why don't we go ahead and dive into something a bit more familiar with most of everybody. I present to you all, the characters. Which is, well, if we look at the roster from 8 to this, whew, wow, we've really come a long way. Mario Kart 64 features 8 playable characters, being Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Toad, Yoshi, Bowser, Wario, and Donkey Kong. Two fun facts is Donkey Kong is now an adult here, grown up from what he used to look like, and Wario actually made a debut in this game as his first debut in a Mario Kart title. Each of these characters were separated into a specific weight class, being light, medium, and heavy. Lightweights have the highest acceleration in the game, medium weights, or also known as the middleweights, have normal acceleration and normal top speed, and lastly, the heavyweights, which have a high top speed but a lower acceleration. Plus, not to mention, heavyweights can quite literally act like ludicrous by saying, Get out the way! Unlike in future Mario Kart titles, where there are more variety in carts to alter the stats of or enhance already existing stats per racer, the only vehicle being driven in Mario Kart 64 is the tried and true Pipe Frame, an absolute icon in the series, and one design that I still hold dear to this very day due to its simple but effective design. Heck, I even run this thing in Mario Kart 8 when I can online, it's fun. But with the character weight classes being pretty bare bones, and with only one cart, why is it even a game that people adore past the nostalgia? Well, allow me to explain. Mario Kart 64's course lineup is what many would call the most memorable. Others would call it the most iconic at a glance. I would love to go in exquisite detail about each of the courses, 
but I'd be here all day. I've got the Mushroom Cup and Special Cup this time around. Luigi Raceway is up first, and man, this course has been tread by me many a time over the years. It's a straightforward, honest-to-god racetrack that I always find rather super addictive to race on. It's very simple, and a fantastic introduction to the actual courses themselves, and viewing it in a game design lens makes for a great tutorial racetrack for new players. Also, one quick thing I would want to point out is the giant Jumbotron TV before the tunnel showing off the race on the big screen. It's a small added detail that shows up in one other track that I still love to this day, Moo Moo Farm. What a fun track you are, you know? I'm glad that Moo Moo Farm is just a simple drive through farmland, has nice relaxing scenery, and man, you know, the music really just makes you want to square dance with your nearest... Uh, mole? <gasps> Wait, what? <laughs> Yeah, Moo Moo Farm is fun and has great scenery, but just you wait until a mole strikes you down while time trialing, then you will understand true horror. Good track though, Koopa Troopa Beach. This is a track I raced on a lot when I was playing my Wii Virtual Console version of the game and always had a hard time mastering the time trial, but racing on the course itself and soaking in the atmosphere really made up for the difficulty I had back then. Nowadays, this course is super addicting to run on time trials and the occasional versus mode when I can get people together to race on it. The layout is simple enough with a lot of ramps and alternate paths you can take, all with the Koopa Troopa theming to boot. Plus, this track did technically show up in Mario Kart 8 via the background of Sunshine Airport. Go ahead, take a look. Calamari Desert. We all have a favorite Mario Kart track, right? Well, in my case, it's this one. I know it's early into the cups, but the moment I played this track, I was hooked. I am not one for desert-themed courses, but this one adds this western theming to it, and between the trains, simple layout, and music, it made racing against this train that much more entertaining. It's the course I most want for a remake, and no, 7 kind of counts, but doesn't really. I'm more or less talking about a full-blown Calamari Desert overhaul, with new routes, shortcuts, possible new theming, and everything. But I am getting sidetracked. The point is this course is one I frequented the most in 64, and the one that holds the most fond memories for me. Totes Turnpike is up first for the Flower Cup, and I hope you're ready to be roadkill. This highway battle takes place under cover of the night so the cops aren't out to bust you. It takes a lot of practice to master this track without hitting any of the cars whatsoever, especially in extra mode, because in that case, you'll be racing in oncoming traffic. Don't die! Frappe Snowland is up next, a very wintry track out in the middle of bumfuck nowhere after a blizzard that just rolled through the area. If you don't pull off the ultra cut at the bridge, this is a pretty basic track. Just don't run into the snowmen, I think there's hidden explosives inside of them. Chaco Mountain is after that, and this one is either fun, or it's hell. At the loop around the lone body of water in that track, there's actually a fence surrounding it at 50cc, but on the other engine classes, it mysteriously disappears. Also, word advice. Watch out for the falling boulders, and don't hit the side walls in midair, especially at the final stretch. It can cost you the race. The second shortest track in the game, Mario Raceway is last, and this track comes and goes at the blink of an eye. It is a very short, minute and a half race on 150cc on a track where the minimap looks like a dog that got stuck inside of a shoe. This may be short, but you always gotta stay on your toes because of that. One wrong move and you may lose the competition, figuratively and literally. Starting the Star Cup at 1,591 meters long, the original Wario Stadium is one of the longest known courses in Mario Kart history. It has a BMX stadium vibe to it, complete with a jumbo screen and a full house to watch the carnage unfold. I'd like to think that Mario Kart DS's Wario Stadium is just nothing but a renovated version of the very original. You think that may ring true? Who knows? Sherbet Land is up next, and the parents of those baby penguins are obviously not paying any fucking attention to their kids. <laughs> the 
those little shits are out in the icy terrain and making the racer spin out like a heavyweight blasting through the competition. Though, one visual touch I like here on this course is that you respawn as a block of ice when you fall into the water and nearly freeze to death. Royal Raceway is third up, and the focal point is the giant ramp that takes you over the body of water the track surrounds. Another thing about this one is that after the ramp, you can actually go see Peach's Castle from Super Mario 64. Yes, you can go drive around the castle grounds and see the sights. Imagine if you could go inside the castle too. Maybe the paintings are still there. Maybe the worlds in the paintings are still there. The one thing about Bowser's Castle I've always found ironic is that this track is 777 meters long, but this track does not require luck to win. You're gonna need some skill to maneuver around the thwomps around half of all the corners. Also, it's been 25 years, Bowser. When is Marty gonna be freed? What did he do to get locked up anyway? Did he try to commit mutiny? Was he treasonous? Did he kill your firstborn child? I don't... I don't know. Welcome to the Special Cup. After some of the most iconic courses in the series, it seems fitting to end it on a high note like this and continue Mario Kart 64's golden streak of good courses. DK Jungle Parkway, one of the only courses I remember playing a lot on my original N64 and sitting very close to our big tube TV. Between the cannon that shoots you out onto the second half of the track, the coconuts being thrown at you to knock you off, and the rather complex layout compared to other courses, I really had a blast running through here, either for a quick drive or even a real race. Yoshi Valley. Alright, let me just say this right now. I used to not enjoy this track. But after going through and mastering the 8 and 8 Deluxe versions so many times, this track clicked with me in seconds. Learning the best route and mastering what used to be a hard course for me felt liberating to say the least. The fact this course can't even display who's in what place unless you know where to look on the map, and the sheer scale of the track itself makes it a unique experience for a Mario Kart game to me. Easily the most fun on Versus Races as well. Banshee Boardwalk. This track is a spooky boardwalk with cheap cheeps hopping around all done at night within what looks to be an abandoned boardwalk. The setting and music for this track really make racing here feel a tad bit uneasy for the first time around, especially compared to the majority of other racetracks. It's hard at times too, with bats flying at you, tight corners, and to tie all this with the AI rubber banding, you have yourself a win you must fight for. Rainbow Road. This track is one of the most iconic to me, and has had a lot of weight being what I would deem my favorite next to Calamari Desert. I constantly found an excuse to race with friends on this track, and time trial it to death. The atmosphere and how grand this track feels in comparison to this SNES Rainbow Road is immaculate. The chain chomps running about, the neon lights of each character's face, and the music. Oh my goodness, the music. This track stood the test of time, and as soon as MK64 landed on the Switch, the first thing I did was race on the good old fashioned double R. I also want to point out how beautiful the version found in Mario Kart 8 and 8 Deluxe is. It's ironic as well, because my other favorite course is on here, Calamari Desert. You see? See that little train just flying around? Yeah, that's it's there. It's so cool. I love this. I love the fact that we have both of these courses collide and it, it's it's so iconic, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting sidetracked, but God, I love Mario Kart. Battle mode in this game is just about as basic as one can get. Everyone involved has three balloons. Try to pop each other's balloons, and the last one standing wins. There is two main differences, though. One is only in play for three or four players. The first two knocked out turn into bomb cars and they can screw over the other players standing. The second is the battle arenas themselves. Big Donut is just a circular arena with a pool of lava in the center. Block Plaza has four structures you can drive on or drive around. Double Deck is a multi-layered arena that's used for games of hide and seek and Skyscraper is another circular arena, and the main rule is to not look down. Not much else I can say about this mode.
Small editor's note, Sporadic forgot to mention rubber banding and we had this whole transition planned, uh, but I want to go ahead and mention right now, before you think we forgot about rubber banding, we did not forget about it. It's a thing. It's quite simple. It's when you're in first place, the AI will just kind of magnetize towards you or rubber band towards you. And there's more you know, complicated and complex parts to it, but since this is an editor's note, I'm not going to get into that. Uh, however, it is a section that I think is, you know, it's worth mentioning its existence. And uh, I'm sure there's other, you know, smaller bits of tech that speedrunners have used. Uh, but also, realistically, you know, rubber banding is kind of the more common uh, part of Mario Kart 64's history, uh, gameplay-wise at least, that is more known by everybody around the globe. It's something that just is in the game inherently. This game has had quite a lot of discoveries over the years it's been out, and there are some that I'm not surprised about, some I'm convinced were only found out of pure boredom, and some that are just fucking funny. One example of a major shortcut in this game is the one in Calamari Desert. You need to go into the tunnel with a star at the first railroad crossing, use it when Lakitu tells you to turn around, hit the wall, and then suddenly, boom, lap counts for some reason. I don't know how often this will work, I, last I read up on it is that it only randomly works. You'll just have to try it for yourself. Another ultra cut is in Frappe Snowland. If you go back behind the bridge, hop onto the side of the track without touching the main track at all, and all you need to do is respawn and just drive forward across the finish line, and that counts the lap. There are a handful of the major shortcuts, like the Yoshi Valley Respawn Ultra Cut, the DK Jungle Parkway Wall Clip Ultra Cut, and the Royal Raceway Respawn Glitch. All of those are pretty precise to pull off, but when you do, you can finish races very quickly. Some of the most well-known discoveries in MK64 are Rainbow Road's Leap of Faith, where you hop off the left side or right side in extra mode, and you'll skip nearly half the track upon making the landing, and Wario Stadium's Wall Hop where you can hop the side walls and can finish a race in less than 30 seconds. One of the funniest glitches I read up on and even watched takes place in Bowser's Castle. A blue shell is required for this, and once you can obtain it, go to where the top of the loop intercepts with the bottom of it, and let the CPUs hit the blue shell and send them straight into the depths of hell. If done right, they'll respawn right at the start of the loop at the bottom, and they'll just keep driving straight into the wall. It's freaking hilarious to watch. Although this is rare, on Royal Raceway, the CPU can basically glitch out and respawn, skipping about half the track. Literally, half the track. You cannot catch up to them at all once those cheating bastards do this. Believe it or not, I myself have had this happen to me once many a year ago on actual hardware. Here's the pictures I managed to take of it. This is from about spring of 2014, and I've never actually seen this on actual hardware ever since then. Weird times. Weird times. As Braddock has said in his own words, It ain't a virtual mementos video if they don't talk about music at least once. See? It's very accurate and backed up by science. <laughs> Music in Mario Kart 64 is a big reason I jump on to this day. The N64 sound font itself is a standout one at that. Several flute and keyboard synths really sound out and are one of a kind. And you can say most are dated, but I will disagree and just say no. Sound font for Mario Kart 64 only enhances the experience and revs up the nostalgia in, even without the nostalgia, I would imagine several would still think the music found in the game to be super polished and fantastic regardless. Songs tend to be reused a lot due to the hardware limitations, but the standout tracks really stand out. Let me go over a few of my favorites. Calamari Desert is one track that always sounds like it's building towards something grander and feels less like a racing song, but one of a great western adventure. 
It's peaceful, exciting, and always fills my ears with joy because of how many good memories I've had with this song blaring in the background of many races. Then we have Rainbow Road. This song is a classic and needs no explanation, but I will try to give a short one regardless. The song that plays here has defined a lot of my early taste in game music, and I will be honest, was such a ride to listen to it on the remake on 8. The flutes and excitement of the song has felt right out the gates and it never gets dull for me. I mean, I would imagine if I played the song over 4 trillion times, maybe it would get a little boring, but come on. It's Rainbow Road. The last track I want to bring light on is one I think a lot of people may overlook, Banshee Boardwalk. Everything about how simple and percussive the song is really adds to the atmosphere of the race itself. The fast moving percussion sounds and the eerie chords haunt this track and add so much life to this desolate boardwalk. It was a standout song due to how little it uses to convey the setting and sometimes less really is more, especially in music. And also. A nice touch is you can hear the screams of players raging as they fall off. With all the songs in the game, each one has a big reason to stand out, but those were the ones I fondly remember and have a lot of nostalgia when I go do listen to any of the songs in their original form. Sure, I like the remakes of a lot of these tracks, but nothing can compare to the true classics. Over the years, Mario Kart 64 has been a game that me and Sporadic frequently go back to, whether it's jamming out to the soundtrack, racing the AI and fighting for the first place spot, to even just enjoying the core game no matter what platform it ends up on. Mario Kart 64 is timeless to me, and by far the most nostalgia filled game that we have covered in Days of the Races thus far. Mario Kart 64 is special, means a lot, and has aged so damn well it's not even funny. For a game developed early in the 64's lifetime, Mario Kart 64 definitely became a pioneer for the three-dimensional games in the series after it. The roughness around its edges really make it stand out more now that there's more games in the series. Some hate it with a burning passion, and others genuinely love the overall simplicity of it. With all this being said though, thank you for watching this video and taking a dive with both of us into one of the great entries of Mario Kart. Make sure to stay safe, subscribe to the channel, and follow me on Twitch because I stream quite a bit nowadays. Also, join the Discord server to stop by and hang out, and stay hydrated. Thanks for watching. Christ! Rubber banding!